All right, welcome back, everyone. I'm here for episode two of Shumatsu Train Dokueku. It's quite hard to say that. <laughs> First episode was fun, a bit wild. Got a very unique premise. We have a 7G network that's gone astray and caused the breakdown of reality as we know it, including people turning into animals, the expansion of distance between people and locations, and it seems potentially uh, entire breakdowns of society as a whole because of the two initial factors. And also maybe there's some also weird stuff outside, outside the boundaries of habited locations. Yeah, weird stuff. Plot-wise, we have a group of young girls who are still human because you only turn into an animal once you reach a certain age. And one of the girls, the main girl, seems to have had a fight with a friend before the apocalypse happened and hasn't seen her since, and has recently found a newspaper which contains a picture of her in, I think it was Ikebukuro or something like that. And so she has gotten on a train with the help of a an old man who transformed into a young man when she put a hat on him, uh, at least temporarily. She has got the train up and running, and along with the rest of her friends, is heading out to Ikebukuro to find her friend. Hmm. Cool idea for a story, and lots of potential for weirdness and cool stuff. I'm looking forward to seeing where the show goes with all of its ideas. So, let's talk about a comment quickly. This comment is from Saltbread. Thank you for the comment. Uh, so the entire first episode feels like it fits square into the old school use of the Denpa genre. For some context, Denpa was a word originally used by a man in the 80s that killed some people over paranoia that said that radio waves were infecting his mind and made him commit the crime. Uh, I'm vaguely familiar with Denpa as a genre. Uh, the two things that spring to mind when I think of it are Serial Experiments Lane, which is very Denpa, and then Deno Coil, which is a bit less odd <laughs> and out there, but is definitely in that same vibe of, you know, as you say later, radio wave esque, <coughs> pardon me, stuff. But I did not know about this history of the, uh, the man who killed people over the classic 5G making me do things. Obviously, it probably wasn't 5G back in the 80s, but same sort of idea. Uh, the actual Denpa genre in anime games books nowadays is mainly used to refer to stories where characters either suffer from hallucinations and delusions or interact with some other kind of world that feels dreamlike or abstract. Sometimes it's used for horror or to make a character seem insane, and sometimes it's just to give the work a very trippy vibe. I'm also vaguely familiar with Denpa sometimes being used as a slang term in modern Japanese to refer to people who are a bit uh, disconnected from society and a bit weird. Uh, however, in the 80s and 90s, the genre was utilised, uh, the way it was utilised fit way more into the radio wave definition of the original word. The words are usually focused on technology affecting people and the world, usually a negative way, which was only enhanced by the economic turmoil Japan was facing at the time. The fear of common everyday life coming apart was rather high at the time, and suddenly evolving possibly malicious technology was definitely a way to break up everyday life. Yeah, that's definitely the sort of vibe you get from shows like Lane. There's a lot of weird ideas about cyber space and a little bit of sort of transhumanist ideas of separation of the the physical body from the soul in a weird way. Yeah, lots of odd stuff came out of that idea. Lane is probably the most famous. <laughs> but continue on with the comment. Back to the point though. This episode feels very much related to the original definition of Denpa with the 7G network concept. It was created, or at least advertised to be, some miracle technology that would connect all the people of the world and bring them closer together. But ironically, all it did was separate them further, both by transforming the people into, in the case of this town, animals that will eventually lose their way of communicating with each other, since they're all different species, and by physically increasing the distance between cities. We don't know what caused Shizuru and Yoka to have a fight and split originally, but in their current situation they are literally being separated by technology that was created to keep people close together. The distance from Agano to Ikebukuro 
IRL is only a couple of hours max. Hmm. So this is a a thing that comes up actually quite a lot in modern discussion of the internet is the fact that despite the fact that the internet means we are in many ways more connected to people than we have ever been before, before <clears throat> people report a very, very high level of feelings of separation from people around them. And there are a lot of people who I would say somewhat naively blame technology exclusively for this, say like, ah, oh, it's all because we have this weird technology and people are focusing on that. There's a lot of extra hidden variables in there, I would say, some of which are influenced a little bit by the existence of the internet. Others are a little bit disconnected from that, like the fact that the... Uh, the work culture, particularly in places like Japan, is getting like more and more hostile to the worker and forcing them to work more and more time and having less and less time for socializing. That is something that is definitely driving a little bit of that separation among people, but isn't really specifically related to the internet and technology. So there's bits of that in there. But there are also hidden factors that are affected by the internet like uh the uh, one that's been brought up quite a quite a lot recently oh i've heard a lot of recently maybe it's been around for a while but the what's the term disappearance of third spaces the idea being that you have your home being a place that you can relax and you know just exist work where you know you go and do work and then you have third spaces where you can essentially go just for the purpose of socializing and in the past this would be things like pubs and I don't know parks leisure centers that sort of thing libraries and over time these things are getting gradually reduced in size or closed entirely and a part of the reason for these things being closed is because people aren't using them as much and a part of that was because people were getting a lot of their socialization done via the internet. And so in a way, the internet had become a third space, except it's a very, very different type of experience. Socializing on the internet is easier, but it's also not the same. What makes it easier is that it removes some arguably fairly important elements of socializing. One particular thing is anonymity. The internet introduces anonymity, and that does allow people to be themselves a lot more openly, without necessarily, or without as much fear of being disliked, fear of repercussions for being who you are. And so there are a lot of people who can socialize relatively effectively online when they're anonymous, when they don't care quite so much about what other people think of them. But when they get out into the real world and have to talk to people face to face, they get quite a bit of anxiety that's caused by an additional layer of fear of what happens if I offend this person and all that. Mm. Yeah. So I would say internet does drive a little bit of the separation by... <sighs> it provides a method of socializing, which is easier, and because of the way humans exist, we tend to take the paths of least resistance, even if they're not good for us we go down that route and that means we neglect to maintain healthier spaces of socialization hmm. that is how i would generally perceive it as i said there's a lot of other factors which play into this socially it's not a simple thing but for the purposes of a narrative like this probably you don't want to bring in everything because you're never gonna get everything in a show like this without a lot of work and with whilst maintaining it being interesting and not feeling too bloated so show is probably going to focus on one aspect of it mm. uh there's something else i was gonna say i think around here uh about the physical distances as well because that is another thing that the internet has done because we're all we are capable of communicating with people over much longer distances, there's a lot less impetus to go and visit people. Yeah, like, I talk to my friends from uni fairly regularly online, but I don't go and see them very often. Yeah, like, I 
think the last time I saw a friend from uni in person was at Christmas. That's three and a bit months ago. That's a fairly long time. That's a quarter of a year. If I, you know, didn't have the internet enabled to commu to enable me to communicate with them more regularly, I might be tempted to go and see them more often, to put in extra effort to travel to see them. Mm. But I don't, because I can just talk to them online. You know, it removes blockades to communicate, but sometimes those blockades were things which forced us to go and communicate in a more impactful way. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, people can sometimes feel farther away than they might have in the past. Another interesting point of view. Yeah. Continue on with the comment. Another technology-related thing. The age they can have until they turn into animals is 21 years and 3 months, which is 255 months in total. Uh, let me just double-check that in my head. Um, 12 times 21 is 240 uh, plus 200. Two, yep, that's correct. 255 is the largest number that can be stored in a byte, 8 bits of memory. Any more than that, and it wraps back up to zero. I'm not sure what it could mean in the show. Maybe after it wraps back around to zero, the 7G glitches up a bit and replaces you with a different species than what you're supposed to be. So with my not super detailed knowledge of computer programming and whatnot, I have a theory here. So as you say, you have an 8-bit thing. There's 8 bits of memory that could be 1s or zeros, and you just use binary to count up in it. Something that can sometimes happen is that if you do not like necessarily sanitize your inputs, this most computer programs nowadays have fail safes to stop this from happening. But if you're like building an engine from scratch or something, you need to be careful with this. Computers will typically allocate a spot for the memory, and then you know, you input the memory in there. Sometimes, if you don't be careful the computer won't realize when it's writing past the allocated memory, and this can lead to issues. And so if your computer program is incrementing the thing by one and it goes past the typical 8-bit integer limit, it could carry over to the next address and rewrite whatever was in there. And that's bad because it leads to some unusual behavior and errors and the like. And particularly because... Typically, the way computers work, the programmer won't necessarily know exactly what address your memory is being stored in. Computer typically decides that on a lower level than higher-end programmers would pay attention to. And so you won't know what memory is going to be affected by any overflow errors. And it can lead to some very weird and unusual behavior, and it's very unpredictable, which would explain why... People are changing into animals for one thing as an error generally, but also why it's very inconsistent. So that's my idea there. <laughs> Maybe a bit too uh, realistic for what the show is going for, but we'll see. Or not. The show might not bother explaining in that detail. Uh, we'll have to see how the other places look before confirming anything. I do think adults turning into animals via technology. Here's some interesting commentary, though. Maybe something about younger generations adapting faster to new tech while older people get left in the dust. Yeah, that's an, an interesting thing. It does seem to generally be true. And a part of it is because of brain plasticity. You know, younger people have an easier time learning new things. That is just true. But also general familiarity with similar technologies creates a lot of transferable skills. You know, like if you've never learned a programming language before, learning a language like C will be a challenge. But if you've learnt other programming languages on the way there, like you've learned Python, uh, Maple, what other languages, Fortran, I don't know, a couple of other languages, then learning C will be easier for you because you're already familiar with the sort of general structures and principles of a programming language. And so for adults to keep up with new technologies. They also need to be actively engaging with new technologies constantly, and not everybody does that. Some people do, though. Uh, 
I can't remember if I've mentioned this. I might have mentioned this uh, last episode. I don't remember. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've mentioned it on something from this season, but I don't know if it was this show. I have a great uncle, I think. Uh, an elderly guy who is hard of hearing and has got a hearing aid with Bluetooth in that he can connect to his iPad for FaceTiming people. You know, he is pretty technology savvy. And a part of that is because he's quite into uh, radio controlled boats. And so he has some familiarity with technology and is interested a little bit in that sort of stuff. And those skills end up being a little bit transferable. It's it's a far cry from the whole learning programming languages and that making other programming languages easier. But just having that little bit of connection to, to technology gives you a much better chance than somebody who doesn't pay attention to technology at all. Mm. Yeah. But there definitely could be some meta commentary on that with the animals. But also in the idea of people who... <laughs> are essentially not compatible with the world as it currently is in a weird way. Because as people increasingly use technology as a primary forms of communication, people who don't do that, typically older generations, gradually get less and less people they can interact with. And so get more and more disconnected from the world around them. Hmm. And so can feel more and more like a fish out of water, to use an apt metaphor. <laughs> Although I don't think we saw any fishes. I feel like we saw reptiles. We saw an iguana, yeah. So fishes wouldn't be necessarily out of the question. Although probably wouldn't survive very long if you transferred into a fish out of water. <laughs> Unless somebody was around to help. Anyway, continuing on. Uh, this comment is getting super long, so I'll just mention one last thing. The titular train itself must... Yeah, much like in Odd Taxi, another anime original focused on communication in relation to technology. Odd Taxi is a great show, would recommend if you haven't seen it. The titular vehicle of both shows puts the people in a situation where they are forced to at least acknowledge the other people around them, which creates easy opportunities for conversation and interaction if you feel like doing so. The difference, obviously, is that taxis work more like a bar table, with you and another person on the other side, while trains, especially in Japan, are more like hundreds of people standing in a single room, so it'd obviously be a way different level of interaction, like only a hi or hello at best, and even just looking at someone in a crowd and going, hey, I know that person from somewhere, maybe. Point is, you're forced to physically stand alongside different kinds of people. Though I have to admit, this is me being kind of idealistic for the sake of a thematic connection, when in actual reality people in taxis and trains will just look awkwardly to the side or look at their phones until they reach their destinations. Depends on the individual, but yeah. Um, again, that's an aspect of the whole, I would say, people being okay with or being used to the socialisation they have online where there's a lack of fear of immediate repercussions for their actions compared to an interaction in real life. But also, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. You know, not wanting to interact with a taxi driver is fine. That's not necessarily going to be a significant impact on your life. Like, it can be. You know, sometimes people have very, very deep conversations with their taxi drivers. But personally, it depends on my mood. You know, sometimes, probably more often than not, I'm not really in the mood to talk when I'm getting a taxi, typically because... If I'm going somewhere in a taxi, I have like plans in my head and I'm thinking about those plans and I don't want to be socializing at that point. Yeah, I'm definitely somebody who needs to be in the right state of mind for socializing or I need to put myself in a state of mind for socializing. It's not necessarily a difficult thing to do, but like it's not something I just will do for a taxi ride. <laughs> but sometimes, for instance, when coming back from a thing, you're more relaxed, maybe a little drunk sometimes. And in those sorts of situations, conversations can flow much easier. Mm. But also, little remark on the train connection. Uh, you mentioned the whole Denpa genre. The Japanese word for train is Densho, which uses the same Den from Denpa, which means electricity. And the Sha actually means car. So train is literally electric car in terms of the kanji that it uses. <laughs> yeah 
So there is also a strong connection to the whole electricity and radio wave stuff in the specific choice of vehicle and the, the naming of that vehicle. Yeah. Also, as I recall, the, the design of the train is a relatively old style train. And also it's a country train. Because one of the things you said about Japanese trains is they're often very busy. That's really only at like rush hours and in cities. Far out from the beaten, tra beaten track, trains are a, a lot less densely populated. And so it will be like a couple of people on a train most of the time. And so there is much greater opportunity for actually talking to people around you. But also Japanese society in general, and particularly in cities, is quite uh, reserved. And there's kind of an expectation that you don't really talk to people around you that much. And this is just generally true in cities, to be honest. Which is another weird thing. <laughs> cities are places with huge population density. And so you might think, with so many people around them, people might feel more connected. But it's the opposite. People feel much less connected in cities. And I would posit that the reason for that is somewhat psychosomatic, in that even if you have the same level of like friends and closeness to your friend group, because there are so many people around you who aren't your friends, that makes you feel a greater sense of disconnection. So like the connection and disconnection, whilst they are like opposite feelings, they aren't necessarily being tracked as one thing. The connection meter has one track and the disconnection has another one. And it's not necessarily that you have less connection, but you have more disconnection. Hmm. Yeah, okay, that's enough of that. This is uh, only 20 minutes in. Uh, I need to quickly pause because I forgot to open the anime. All right, let's get into it. Timer version on YouTube, picture and picture version in the description down below. If you could, if you're watching the picture and picture version, mute to this video in a separate tab. More view time helps the channel. Let's go. This is the friend, right? Shy, I see. <laughs> Into the tunnel we go. It's very dark. Face of determination. What's on the other side? Nice sense of tension there. Just long enough to build it up. Very pretty. Across a bridge. Very calm water. Ha <laughs> 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 
Very nice of you to let people know. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> that fight between optimism and not quite pessimism, but caution. <laughs> A little bit of a wobble. You're trying to slow the thing down. Oh dear. That was a very nice cut, suddenly making it a lot louder. Bridges don't usually curve like that. Yeah, that's definitely not a normal bridge. Interesting statue as well. Might have to go look up the Koma River, see if there is a statue around it. Nice low hum in the soundtrack. <laughs> Maybe it's both. <laughs> it's a fair question do we actually know what direction it is how <laughs> does that make sense <laughs> Sounds like a bit of a, yeah, influenced view. Do you have it with you, though? Unsurprisingly. Very nice. It's not that much. <laughs> How are we going to buy anything? So we have no supplies, apart from a couple of plants. <laughs> Simple stuff. Yeah, but like plants is very, very good. You can grow food.
I mean, I guess. Changes of clover are somewhat important. Less important than food, I would argue, but... That doesn't sound sanitary. <laughs> Lol. <laughs> they know each other very well. What's in the plants? And we've got a fog rolling in. Weird stuff is about to start happening, I feel. Kill a sniveler. <laughs> <laughs> Is the fog making them all a bit more? I don't know. <laughs> the plant is coming alive and it's grown quite a bit. <laughs> What's up, doggo? What's out there? <laughs> Young ones covering her ears. Is she bad at scary stuff? <laughs> like Nessie, I see. <laughs> no, it's it's a swan peddler. Hello. <laughs> yes, yes it is. <laughs> Very fun musical cues. So, explain yourself a little bit. <laughs> A researcher, a hermit. Oh. It's <laughs> a lot of questions. Probably. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> what? Why? Could you explain why? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Is that all you're after? I'm back. Could actually be helpful. <laughs> of course. Ah, a vape. <laughs> vape cartridges. Lol. <laughs> I wonder if he is below 21 years and three months. <laughs> I see. Mm. The wibble wobble surgery. Mm. Could be something like that. <coughs> Bad point. <laughs> Very good point. I'm sure. <laughs> Of course. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, the water is rising. That's not good. The water is rising on the track behind them, they can't go back. All right. <laughs> yeah. The tide's coming up. <laughs> Such map. Jeez. 
empty. It's scared still. Ah. I see. <laughs> yep. If the motor floods that will essentially be trained dead without severe repairs, which you probably don't know how to do. Oh dear, he's going back. <laughs> oh, water level's going back down. What's up, doggo? Ah, is it a swell? It's a swell. Oh dear. <laughs> Get out of there quickly. <laughs> Full speed ahead. <laughs> All right, speed is going up. I saw a house on one of those islands. Rip anybody who lived there. <laughs> and we got some bitter melon. A renewable food source. Yeah, that's, that seems pretty fucked. I mean, do you have much choice right now? Very cool skyscape. A toddy gate, interesting. A very desertified area. And there's those cop circles. But we've got roads as well. So the old infrastructure still exists. All right, first stop. What's it going to be like, I wonder? There are people. Mushroom, I see. Something about her seems a little suspicious. I don't know what is. <laughs>
Full stuff. I need to get, grab a drink quickly. I'll be right back. So, this is a fun episode. It's not as trippy as the last one, but it's still quite fun. It's It seems more to do with establishing the baseline experience of traveling on this train and a bit more solidly establish the character dynamics, which are quite interesting. We have the Gyaru girl. I'm not going to remember their names clearly, but I think the Gyaru is Remy. And she is quite clearly the positive, optimistic one, always looking on the bright side. And then we have the short one, whose name I do not remember. See if I can check quickly. Uh, let's see. Monday shows. Shumatsu train. Annie list. <laughs> Give it a second. Akira. Yes. Akira is a bit more... Uh, what was the term I used? Cautious. Approaches things with a, a degree of realism. It borders a little bit on... Uh, what's the word? <laughs> the opposite of optimism. Uh, I said it during the show. It's escaping me right now. Negativity, you know? Pessimism, that's it. <laughs> She's a bit more almost pessimistic, but not quite. Like, she doesn't assert that the worst is going to happen, but she is seemingly keenly aware that we don't really know much here and there's a possibility that things could be going very, very badly if we don't plan effectively. But at the same time, we also establish her as fairly skilled in a couple of ways. The most important one is the knowledge of Morse code, and she is the one who uh, goes and communicates with the old man about the state of the train and asks him questions. And she's able to do it very, very quickly, which is very impressive, you know. <laughs> like, I have, like had Morse code knowledge in the past. There are some things which are very easy. SOS is a very easy thing to remember. But like, I remember I've played um, Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes. Very fun game. And one of the, the modules on that bomb defusal game is a Morse code one where you've got to read off a five letter Morse code signal. But it's, you know, you as the diffuser read off the Morse code as like dots and dashes. And the idea is that the uh, the diffuser, or not the diffuser, the helper with the manual then translates that into letters and tells you what to press and all that. <laughs> but I did kind of, from that, from playing that, pick up a little bit of Morse code. But it's still really hard to do. And particularly in that game, Keep Talking Nobody Explodes, it's quite hard because you need to be reciting the the things you're seeing as you're seeing them. And if you don't recite them in an appropriate timing manner, sometimes the things you are reciting will <laughs> cause you to get confused between what you're reciting and what you're seeing. So like if you see a dot dash dot, if you say the dot whilst you're looking at the dash, sometimes your brain will not, <laughs> will get confused between which one you're seeing and which one you're saying. And thus will say a, a dot when it's meant to be a dash. Which is why I usually wait for the gaps between letters to say, you know, the whole thing very, very quickly. <laughs> mm. Yeah, but it, it, essentially the point is it's quite hard and requires quite a deal of uh, training, I guess, and practice to be able to, like, translate in your head as you're hearing it. Or not necessarily even translate, but just understand in your head as you're hearing it what is being said. Hmm. So, pretty cool that she has that talent. So she's probably going to be quite useful. Yeah, but also because of her opposite stance when it comes to outlook with Raimi, those two end up clashing a little bit. But the only time that it almost seems like it's getting towards being a bit actually antagonistic between them is when the fog rolls in. Which is 
I'm not sure if that was caused by the fog or if the fog is a... It was being kind of used as a visual metaphor for the cloud coming over their interactions. Because also the um, the girl who is piloting the train, whose name is Shizuru, Shizuru also says something that's a bit negative during that period about her not asking anybody else to come and she would have been fine going alone and all that, which I've said everybody the most. <laughs> but also, whilst all this is going on, we also have Nadeshko, Nadeshki Hoshi, that, yeah, I said that wrong, Nadeshko Hoshi, who I described her last time as like a, a team of mom, team mum sort of thing. But... She's very much being a, a mediator in many ways. But not just that, but also kind of acting as the a group conscience. She's not just like calming down the fights and making sure everybody's getting along. She also like does scold people when they go a bit too far. Like she tells uh, Shizuru to, you know, apologize for the, the comment about not wanting them to come and all that. Mm. So they've got a quite tight knit group. Also, there's a thing that struck me, particularly in the early parts of the episode where we had the, the back and forth between Remy and Akira, that those two's vibes kind of almost comes across as like the, the classic angel and devil on your shoulder, where one telling you to, it's not exactly that sort of good evil sort of thing, but it's pessimism and uh, optimism almost. Mm. It's almost like they're, they're aspects of a a, a wider character, you could say. Mm. In which case, Shizuru would be the the drive for for adventure and also to achieve the primary goal. Nadeshko is is the conscience that directs your moral standings and also uh, coordinates everything else to some extent makes everything work together. And then, of course, we've got the optimism, which keeps your spirits up, and the caution and pessimism and realism, which keeps you prepared for the worst. Mm. Interesting dynamics, generally. The old man on the swan boat is very odd. And one thing he said is particularly interesting to me. It was the line he said about don't trust anything that you can't verify yourself. Because I can see two potential ideas present in there. I'm not sure which one, maybe it'll be both, that the show is going to go with. It will depend on the general vibe from here on out, what you'll think of that line. The first one is information about the world. The world is pretty crazy right now. And there may be a lot of people who have certain ideas about what the world is like, and it may not be applicable to everyone. And they may be wrong, they may be mistaken. You know, there may be people who have biased views of things. It's very true. And also, just from a general life perspective, that can be said to be true as well. As a quote I really liked, I can't remember where I saw it. I don't think it was like a, a famous person quote, but just something somebody on the internet said. Uh, it was something like the process of becoming an adult is realizing which of the things people said would work for everything. Sorry, for every one work for you. Because there's a lot of stuff like that. There's a lot of particularly uh, psychology and sociology and all that sort of uh, area of research and you know human behavior stuff, where a lot of the knowledge we have is based on <coughs> based on the law of large numbers. Essentially, we can predict with pretty strong accuracy how most people will, will react to a thing. You know, there's a bell curve, and most people will fall into a particular part of it. You know, bell curves are, like, really quite accurate a lot of the time, depending on the standard deviation. But, you know, we can say with pretty high certainty, 99% of people will respond positively to this particular action or whatever but there'll be people who are on the boundary. And when there are like so many different facets of 
being an individual, there's almost certainly going to be something that works for most people that doesn't work for you. Hmm. So that's something that might be the intended purpose of that line. The other one is we might actually not be able to trust that guy. You know, he said, don't trust anything you can't verify yourself. Except for the stuff I say, obviously, I'm trustworthy. <laughs> and that, to me, definitely brings up vibes of conspiracy theories. Because there are a lot of conspiracy theorists who are like, oh yeah, I don't believe the scientific establishment and all their literature and research because I can't perform the experiments myself. Except sometimes they can and they just choose not to. And sometimes they can and they do it and they find out they're wrong and they just completely ignore that and say there's some other reason why it's wrong. <laughs> the most famous example of this is Flat Earthers. There have been a number of projects where Flat Earthers have designed an experiment to test that the Earth is flat and said, if we get this result, it means the Earth is flat. If the Earth is round, we'll get this result. And they've got the result that indicates the Earth is round and they've just ignored it and kept on being Flat Earthers. Yeah, it happens all the time. There are a lot of conspiracy theorists who think that if you cannot verify something yourself, including if you can't be bothered to, then you shouldn't believe it. And that's a very, very naive view. Ultimately, in the modern world, there is so much knowledge of humanity that we cannot know all of it. We cannot test everything ourselves. And so we have to, to some extent, rely on the experts in certain fields to make conclusions. Now, this is not necessarily going to be applicable to this world, you know, the idea of we have to adhere to experts or anything. But it could be that this whole idea of don't trust anything that you can't verify is essentially the ramblings of a a conspiracy theorist and it's him who we should not be trusting because he does make a lot of odd claims you know he says the entire world has stopped existing outside of the what was it this this train line i can't remember what he called it and he said something about like a wall of something to the west and then the people of the east siding with the goats or something <laughs> It did all feel a bit mad, a bit unreasonable. But this is a world where there is a lot of unreasonable stuff happening. And so it's hard for me to really say, oh yeah, this guy's totally not trustworthy. He's totally just a crazy dude. He could be both. He could be trustworthy and a crazy dude. <laughs> that does happen as well. Yeah, and I'm, I did mention at one point, I called him a hermit. That's kind of something that did happen quite a bit historically. People would go and isolate themselves for a long time to meditate, kind of, you know, separate themselves from the rest of society so they can focus on their selves, but also, quite often, to research a particular thing, you know. And sometimes they would come back and have researched a thing and come to a pretty interesting conclusion about it. You know, particularly maths. It sometimes happened with mathematicians. They would isolate themselves for a while to do some maths. <laughs> and, you know, the advantage of maths is that there is correct answers <laughs> to some extent. So you can, you can very much check your work and people can know if you're wrong. People can know if you're crazy. People are less able to know if you're crazy when it comes to, you know, <sighs> statements about, you know, metaphysical stuff. His statements are verifiable statements, though, so we might be able to tell in the future if he's trustworthy or not. Mm. There's also the, the whole river swell thing, which is quite interesting. I called it a swell. I think the actual term is tidal bore. Well, I say tidal bore. I'm not sure if it actually is intended to be a tidal bore or something a bit less realistic, you know? A tidal bore is essentially when the tide comes in, you need very specific uh, setup for this to happen. You have a wide mouth to a river that narrows up. The tide brings water into the river, and as the, the river narrows, that momentum carries that water into a wave, essentially, that travels up the river. But 
I don't know that tidal bores have the the trough b- before them that we get quite clearly here. That is very commonly referenced as a, a signal of incoming tsunamis. And tsunamis are not exactly the same as tidal bores. They do kind of work in a similar way in terms of the general motion of the water. You know, it's it's not necessarily water being pulled. Like it's not massive water being pulled, but it's it's more water being like squished, kind of, in terms of like molecular level stuff. In terms of like surface level observations, it is basically water being pulled. But because of that water pull, I feel like tidal bores probably typically don't have a trough before them because the trough happens when there is a dip in water first and then that's where the the big wave behind comes from you know because it's with the tidal waves that do have receding uh troughs before them not all tidal waves have this this is a thing that only occasionally happens not only occasionally it happens quite often just just not all the time uh so most tsunamis that happen are caused by tectonic activity under the under the ocean. And if you have a tectonic activity which pushes water up, then the initial wave will be a peak. And so the first thing to arrive at the beach will be a peak. But if you have a tectonic activity which causes a drop, then the water will go trough first and a wave will then form to fill in the trough. So you'll have the trough before the wave. And yeah, I don't know that that happens with tidal bores. I don't think it does. So it feels like a tsunami. Now, that being said, not everybody knows this much detail about waves. And the common view of waves is sometimes that they just always have troughs because they quite often do, (laughs) especially in sort of general conditions because most of the times when there is a wave there's almost always waves around it because like there's only ever one initial wave that doesn't have a trough before it every other wave after it will have a trough because you know that's how ripples work and so some people do have a generic view that oh all waves have troughs before them which is not actually true but yeah, it's it's a present idea in some people's minds. Mm. But that occurrence has the obvious effect of cutting off our escape route. We can no longer go back. We have to push forward. It removes our safety net, so to speak. Hmm. I wonder if there's some other metaphor there. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Let's go through the episode. Look for more details. Oh, one thing. I really, really like this opening scene. Almost nothing is said in it. It doesn't give us much proper information, but it tells us one very, very important thing. Well, two, actually. First of all, Yoko has been in this town for quite a while, or had been, before the apocalypse. And two, that she was very, very shy. You know, we kind I kind of got the impression that she wasn't like the most outgoing person anyway in the initial episodes, but this solidifies her as, at least when she was a child, being like incredibly shy. Mm. And I really just generally the the fact that it's such a short scene. Is really really good because one of the interesting aspects of this there are two major interesting aspects of the show first of all is the relationship between yoka and shizuru and the mystery that surrounds it and secondly is obviously the trippy stuff that's happening in the world and this scene is really really effective in reminding us of this relationship the fact that it is the driving force of this entire adventure this entire story and giving us just a hint more information. Mm. I really love it. And I really hope that the show continues with this sort of storytelling with regards to this this aspect of it, where it just keeps dropping just little scenes to give us just a bit more context. 
And over time, we can build up a bigger and bigger picture, like fitting puzzle pieces together. Mm. Yes, and then we also have the scene of the train going through the tunnel, which I also like. We hold this shot of us coming out of the tunnel for quite a while, and it's long enough to just build up a little bit of tension about what's on the other side. Because, as we know, none of these characters have ever left their town since the apocalypse, and they have no idea really what's out there. And neither do we. And so it's it's a surprise for us. And when we do come out, we of course get the classic blinding flash, which then gradually fades to reveal a very stunningly beautiful blue waterway over which we are travelling. And I did quickly look on Google Maps in my little hunt for a drink. But this train line does in fact go over the Camo River. And in fact, it goes over it a couple times. It more or less follows the Camo River until it reaches basically the like far out reaches of Tokyo. Mm. Yeah. I I don't think though that the Camo River is as big as this. And certainly, I doubt there are any bridges that are as long as this along it. It's one of the things you'll notice about bridges, particularly train bridges that go across rivers. They almost never bend. They're almost always straight across. This is because going straight across is much more structurally sound. Yeah. The way this is designed is almost more like a roller coaster than a train bridge. Mm. Yeah. So we have questions of timing. Again, we get a little bit of edge from Shizuru being a, a bit harsh to people because she's having to focus on the train driving, in part because it seems that she can't slow down. <laughs> Or at least she initially can't slow down. Obviously later she can. So there's something weird happening there. Something like perhaps expansion of space-time. <laughs> or I guess, would it be contraction? Uh, I'm just thinking how things work. So if she's pulling the brakes to slow down, then she would be traveling at less distance. And so if the space expanded, or the expansion of the space was faster than the rate of deceleration. Yeah, so it's expansion. <laughs> Essentially, the idea is, even if she is slowing down, if space is expanding faster than she is slowing down, at least in terms of like the direction she's moving, then the slowing down won't actually do anything. <laughs> at least from her perspective, is the idea, I guess, that I have. Hmm. Yes, and there's some very, very stark curves there. And I really like the sound design we get outside the train. It's very, very jarring. We get lots of wind whistling past as well. Good stuff. It does provide a pretty solid sense of, like, kind of chaos and concern over what might happen. Hmm. Yeah. We start talking about Ikebukuro and the things we can do there and how little money we have. <laughs> also, this is a very odd thing. I've got a little over 3,000 yen. So a thousand yen or so. I'm not sure if this is her being facetious with the whole, oh yeah, it's totally over 3,000 yen-ish. <laughs> or if it's Another instance of some weirdness going on in the world. Like, a thousand yen is now more than three thousand yen. Or something weird like that. Mm. I think it's probably the first thing that I probably just heard being silly with it. Mm. Yeah. Packing the bare necessities like a shirt. Hmm. And a bunch of fairly simple foods. We've got soybeans. Pretty good. Chicken nude, I imagine. Chicken noodles soup. Dashi base. Some rice. 
I don't know what Campio is. And Bonito Flakes, which are, I think, flakes of dried fish, I want to say. Typically used as like a topping for a thing. I, I think it's the thing that they put on top of takoyaki. But all, all simple stuff that doesn't really make a meal. But one of the things we do have is the bitter melon, which is actually supremely useful. It's probably the most useful item she has here because that is renewable food source. It's not necessarily going to be the most nutritious. You know, it's one thing. I don't think bitter melon is a superfood. It's not something that you can get all your nutrients from. But at the very least, you're unlikely to starve. Plus, when the fog rolls in, it overgrows itself a little bit. And so presumably, in between each destination, I'm guessing we're going to have an overgrowth of bitter melons. Mm. They might eventually start taking over the, the train. Yeah. I did say... Uh, I noticed a, a statue on one of the islands that they pass. I went and googled the Kama River. I couldn't find any pictures of them, so I don't know if that's a real thing or not. I'm going to presume not based on the general vibe I'm getting from the Kama River. It seems like it's mostly weirded out, you know? Hmm. Yes. And then the thing arrives. Another aspect of Akira, she is seemingly scared of things. A bit of a scaredy cat. Not super scared, just enough to want to not accept <laughs> or to hide herself when things are getting scary. Hmm. What do they call it again? Was it... Do they call it classy? They say it somewhere around here. Komasi. It's, ah, yeah, it's it's Nessie, but with the Ne from Loch Ness replaced with Koma. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but of course, it's just a guy on a on a duck pedalo. I said swan pedalo the first time, but it's clearly a duck. <laughs> One moment. I'll look at something quickly. So as it comes in, the fog dissipates around it a little bit. I just want to look at its eyes. So from this front angle, it looks like its eyes are in the front and looking forward. But then when we go to the, the side angle, its eyes are on the side and looking to the side. That might just be an artistic choice, but makes me a little bit suspicious. Hard to tell with a show like this <laughs> when something is just you know, a weird art thing. And how much of it is like, yes, this is something you should be paying attention to. There was no, like, attention drawn to it from the direction or anything, so I don't think it's necessarily something to be weirded out by. Mm. Yes, but he's very weird. Yes, in harmony with goats, untrue to their name, charged recklessly as wild boars. Weird. What was the line before this? So the first thing is about the wall. The fungi to the east tower high overhead. It mentions fungi in the next place has mushrooms. So there may be some connection there. Bracingly conspiring to subjugate. So looking to take control of people. Maybe it's already happened. Further yet to the east. Wait, were these both in the east? I thought one was to the west and one was to the east. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> There's some wild stuff, basically, is what he's saying, but we have no way of confirming any of this yet. And he gives us a map, which I'm going to look at again later because they do open the map to look at it. Mm. Might have some meaning. Marikoro, which are, they indicate like 
tobacco things. Vape cartridges. But, like, when you don't have a vaping machine, does that really actually do anything? I don't know. I don't vape, so... My dad does, though. Or he did. He, I think he stopped. <laughs> Funny thing about vaping, and this is an interesting thing about technology in general, and the way that we sometimes leap into it a bit too quickly. The idea of vaping was one that sounds pretty reasonable. It was, if you are struggling to quit smoking, then you can swap to vapes, which essentially satisfy your desire for nicotine, but without the health deficits, or at least as much, and then you can wean yourself off that. So it's a healthy alternative alternative to cigarettes while you wean yourself off that. Obviously, that in itself, not a particularly good business model, and vapes weren't used as medical technology. They were sold by the market. Sold by capitalists who don't actually care about your health. I don't know if there was any, at any point, any medical recommendation for vaping over as a tool for cigarette cessation. But that was essentially the idea of them, and it was what a lot of people went into. What actually ended up happening was because a lot of people switched to vaping because it was healthier. Because it was healthier, they didn't have as many qualms about using it, and so they used it a lot more, got more addicted to nicotine, and then also smoked more. It didn't work. And that's kind of what happened to my dad. My dad uh, used to smoke a long time ago. And then I think it was when my mum got pregnant with uh, my older brother, their firstborn. My mum basically said, you need to quit now. And so he quit. He more or less went cold turkey and didn't smoke except for the occasional cigar at like special events for a long time. It, it was definitely until after me and my brother had moved out. But vaping came along and he started vaping. And through the vaping, go back onto cigarettes. Yeah. <laughs> I I think he is now cutting them back again. I don't know if he's managed to fully quit again. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Then we move on. But we also see, as they move on at some point around here, the water level behind them rising. Mm. Come to think of it, I mentioned tidal bores and the fact that they are created by tides, but I don't think they have a troughs. But we see in the sky that there are lots of like new things, new planetary objects in the nearby space. And so there could be a different tidal system here where there's maybe two tides, a little tide and then a big tide from a, a little planet going by and then a big one. That would be an interesting explanation. I doubt that's going to get focused on. That seems far too minor a thing to, to world build about. Mm. Yeah. One interesting thing the the guinea pig, who is the grandmother of what's her name again? Yoko? Or y Yuko? Anyway. She comes with the old man to the train track and puts the hat on him. It seems to me that this may mean that the old man and guinea pig can communicate, perhaps? Or and this is maybe more likely, actually, now that I think about it. Uh, she's a who talked to the guinea pig because she is Yoko's grandmother and told her about the plan and this was a part of it. Because the guy does say they had decided to communicate at 5pm every day. Hopefully, timing-wise, uh, that works out. Like, there's no weird um, temporal anomalies that break that. Although, there may be a bigger issue, which is if the the tidal wave behind has severed the track, then communicating via knocking on the track would no longer work. <laughs> so, they may have completely cut themselves off. Mm. Yes. 
This is a really pretty picture. The reflection of the land in the water and the sky and the train looks really great. It is kind of reminiscent of it's Spirited Away. I think it's Spirited Away, where there's a a train, I think. Or it might have been a, some other vehicle that just goes just along the surface of the water like this. Some Ghibli movie, I'm sure. Here's the map. So, bear, mushroom. Okay, yeah. So this will be, presumably, the villagers. But also, I will note that there is a break in the line just before the end. Mm. Yeah, so animals, clearly. And that's a sun bear, I'm pretty sure. Then we've got fungi for the next stop. Then what is that? A, a cat? A rat? A, yeah, I'm going to say rat, that is. So I don't know. This is... I'm not entirely sure. It's either a banana peel or a hand or a ghost. Like, these are not the best drawings. There are some that are more notable. Like, this looks like a stomach. Uh, this one looks like a pipe. This is somebody jumping. Uh, this is a kappa, clearly, with the, the head thing. But some of them are, like, super abstract. Like, what on earth is this one? It's just a circle with a smaller circle in it. Or a dot in it. That could be anything. That could be an eyeball. It could be a boob. <laughs> no idea. I doubt it's a boob, but <laughs> it's a land of nudists, clearly. <laughs> there are also a number of blank spaces. Also, unless we're doing like several villages per episode, we're surely not going to visit all of these places. Actually, I'm going to quickly check the train line and see if I can work out where Ikebukuro is as a stop. So, be right back. Okay, it is the Cebu Ikebukuro line going from Agano as its start point to Ikebukuro at the end. And there are exactly 31 stops and there are exactly 31 symbols on this chart. So, presumably, it is exactly that. And so there is, quite notably, a disconnect between the final two stops, between whatever's before Ikebukuro and Ikebukuro. What was it? Uh, Shinamachi is the one before Ikebukuro. Mm, interesting stuff. Yeah. Then we get the Morse code. Connected, but... <laughs> The fact that he starts going choo-choo in the Morse code is very, very silly <laughs> and very fun. Mm. Also, the fact that the engines will probably fail if they get waterlogged, definitely true. Engines do not like being filled with water. <laughs> and we get the tide going out and immediately it's like, huh, that's unusual. And then the wave is coming, and they have to flee quite fast. And there is a moment here, I think, in the overhead shot. Yeah, there are islands with houses on them. <laughs> As they go past. <laughs> Interesting. Hope nobody lived there. And now we have no way back, so we must press onwards. And press onwards we do with our friends in tow, through a fairly desolate-looking landscape. Eventually arriving in Higashi Agano, I think it was. There's something about this person. I don't know what it is about their design, or the way they're presented, or maybe it was in the music cues, but there's something that makes me suspicious of her. I think it was probably the way she was introduced. The fact that we have our characters standing, looking around, being interested in what's around them, and then we show them feet first and walking very, very... How would I describe it? It's almost a shuffle. Yeah, the, the feet do not move very far off the ground. Now, to be fair, I think that is how you're supposed to walk with the whole traditional kimono thing. Yeah, you're not supposed to be making big leg movements. But I don't know. That 
severe adherence to tradition, along with the mushroom on the head, makes me think something might be weird. <laughs> I mean, something's definitely weird, but something might be like bad weird. Mm, but we'll see. So that's that. Hope you enjoyed the episode. I'll see you again for the next one. Bye-bye.